Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Alexandra Alvarado. I'm the Director of Marketing and Education at the American Apartment Owners Association. We're so glad that you can join us today. We have a lot of updates for you, especially if uh, you know what's been going on in the last year in New York. Um, not just uh, new updates, but also some summaries of some previous updates, just as refreshers. And we have with us, as usual, our two favorite attorneys in New York, uh, Justin and Robert Friedman. Uh, both are uh, attorneys with a lot of experience in New York, and they're going to be sharing some of their updates. Uh, before we get to that, though, just want to let you all know that we are recording this. We'll be sending it to you tomorrow via email, and we'll also send you the PowerPoint slides for reference. And if you do need to follow up with any questions with our speakers, we'll put that in there. We are going to have about an hour here, maybe more, maybe less, really just depending on how many questions you all have. We're going to try to get to as many questions as possible while we're here Um on uh, the call today. So uh, let me go ahead and just give you a brief uh, background on the speakers today. So we have with us um, Robert Friedman, also Bob, uh, loves sharing his knowledge of law, 44 years of experience as a New York attorney. He's written books, newspaper columns, and even articles for the AAOA blog as well. He's done several webinars for us and other associations as well. And he attributes his success to client education, community involvement, and um, he really does a great job of helping uh, landlords and also business owners as well. And uh, Justin Friedman, who's on here as well, is Bob's son. Taking after his dad, he earned his JD from uh, Catholic University Columbus School of Law in 2017. And uh, he is committed to utilizing his skills that he honed over the course of his previous career to best serve his clients now in New York alongside his dad. So we have a great team, a uh, great family team here. And I'm glad that uh, you all could join us today. So we're going to pass this along to Robert to get started. And and uh, again, for the questions, I forgot to mention, please put them in the question box and we will get to them at the end. So Robert, I'll let you take it away from here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I just have a warning before we get started that this um, webinar is not a substitute for legal advice. You need to consult with your own legal advisors to see what is best in your particular situation. And uh, this also this uh, what we're talking about today is for the most part limited to uh, New York law. We will take questions at the end. Uh, if you don't have an opportunity uh, to ask questions or we don't get to your questions, we'd be glad to answer your questions. If you email us um, or call us, um, contact information will be on the last slide. Even though the uh, New York Tenant Protection Act of 2019 has been with us for almost five years, uh, we see very commonly that uh, many landlords are not aware of the, uh, the broad changes that were brought about by uh, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019 uh, as to evictions and also as to screening uh, tenants, uh, which really limited the ability of landlords even more so to uh, screen tenants um, and to um, renew leases. So these are some of the more, most common um, topics that many landlords are not aware of. Um, for instance, that um, it used to be uh, you had a fixed term lease uh, beginning January 1st and December 31st. The tenant would have to be out uh, at the end of the lease term. You would not have to give them any sort of notice. Uh, but now uh, there is, you must notify the tenants, whether they're on a lease or month to month, that you're not going to renew uh, their lease or, or, or uh, keep them on. So if the uh, tenant's been there for less than one year, you must give them a 30 day notice. Uh, if it's less than two years, 60 days. And if it's two or plus years, it must be 90 days notice to. Uh, non-renewal of the lease or to increase the rent. I'm um, also uh, very commonly uh, security deposits. Um, they must be returned within 14 days of when the tenant vacates the apartment or you must give them a, um, a reason or an explanation, itemization of why you're withholding your deposit. 
Uh, if you don't do that, they're entitled to their return of secure deposit, uh, regardless of what they may owe you in damages or rent. Um, also, there is uh, you're also required um, to give uh, tenants notice uh, before they at the end of the before the end of their lease term uh, that you will inspect the uh, apartment and let them know what needs to be done. Um, also, um, used to be a way of um, providing additional security to you. Um, if you thought the tenant was a, a credit risk, um, you would ask for more than one month's rent in security. You can no longer let you do that. Uh, security deposit can be no more than one month's rent. Um, there's also limitations on late fees. And what we're talking about here is residential um, tenancies. Um, late fees can must be the lesser of $50 or 5% of the monthly rent. Um, and it used to be, if the, even though the tenant was paying uh, the monthly rent, if they were um, if they owed you late fees or other charges, you could evict them for for not paying late fees that they owed. Um, now um, evictions must be only based on non-payment of rent. Uh, you are no longer allowed to charge application fees, uh, but you can charge um, up to twenty dollars for a credit report. Uh, there's also uh, quite a few changes regarding manufactured home parks. Um, you, uh, it used to be that you did not have to offer a tenant a one-year lease if they were um, if they were not in good standing, if, if they hadn't been paying their rent. Now you must offer um, tenants a, uh, a one-year lease, even if they are not in good standing, one-year renewal lease. Uh, late fees and manufactured home parks are limit to 3%, and there are no, now all sorts of protections in the rent to own um, situations. Uh, there's language that's required if you have a rent to own um, tenant. Um, annual rents are capped at 3%. Um, they can be up to 6% for uh, in certain situations, rent increases. Now we're seeing more and more of uh, issues with uh, source of income discrimination lawsuits. Um, there's source of income discrimination protection, both in the New York human rights laws, in county laws and local laws, including city laws. Uh, basically, you must consider all sources of income the same. Uh, it used to be, um, this is a major change because it used to be um, you would screen out tenants for th those who had uh, a, a long history of full-time employment uh, because those were the best credit risks. Someone that's um, been employed full-time uh, for many years was a good credit risk. You know that if they didn't pay their rent, if you had to sue them, you could garnish their wages. Um, so uh, all sources of income are protected under the law. Uh, Federal, state, or local public assistance, such as cash assistance, um, Department of Social Services, for instance. Federal, state, or local housing assistance, such as, such as Section 8 vouchers. Child support, you must consider ch the child support amount as income. Alimony, foster care subsidies, and Social Security, um, or SSI. Uh, anyone who attempts to rent or sell a housing unit can be accountable for discrimination, including owners, management companies, brokers, co-op boards, and condo associations. So this is applies to co-ops and condos. Uh, these are types of discriminatory behavior may include listing or advertisements that use phrases such as no Section 8, no DSS, which would be Department of Social Services, County Department of Social Services, no SSI, no payment programs or apartment has not been approved for any vouchers or subsidies. Um, so if you refuse to rent, sell, or otherwise deny housing based on use of legal sources of income, providing different terms or privileges, or denying the use of facilities to residents based on source of income, such as rooftop patio, that is available to all residents except those with a Section 8 voucher. So examples of evidence of source of income discrimination are refusal to include a household member's social security income when calculating eligibility for an apartment. 
uh, a broker steers a potential tenant to less desirable apartments upon learning that the new tenant intends to pay with a rental assistance voucher. So um, a group of landlords in Cortland County uh, brought a lawsuit um, against the state saying that the source of income laws are unconstitutional um, under the Fourth Amendment uh, because with a Section 8, if you accept Section 8, you consent to inspection of your properties and records to determine reasonableness, reasonableness of the rent unit and rent requested. Um, and in Cortland County Supreme Court, um, the justice did declare that the source of income law is unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. Um, so the that that case is on appeal, of course. The New York State Attorney General has appealed that decision. Uh, that was just the Supreme Court, which is the lowest of the New York trial courts. So um, until we have a determination on that from the appellate division or higher court, uh, we still should be complying with the source of income uh, laws. Uh, and there are prohibitions against income requirements for recipients of publicly fund funded rental assistance. Um, there's prohibitions on requiring the tenant voucher cover the entire monthly rent. You cannot consider a renter's credit score if the voucher covers the entire monthly rent. So um, if it doesn't cover the um, entire monthly rent, um, there is a procedure that you must go through as far as considering credit scores. And this is on a case by case basis. And um, if anyone is considering credit scores um, with these voucher programs where it does not cover the entire um, rent, um, you can notify me, I can email you. There's a certification that you must maintain for two years if you're considering credit scores or credit histories for people that are on these voucher programs. We could devote an entire um, hour to the, all the procedures and considering credit scores of people uh, that present vouchers vouchers that do, that do not cover their entire rent. We have, we have many clients that have problems with um, dogs on the property um, that people, even though they have a no pet policy, um, and basically emotional support animals um, are not considered pets, uh, and therefore your no pet provisions don't apply to them. So basically, um, a person that has an emotional support animal will ask for a reasonable accommodation to your no pet provision. And um, emotional support animals, uh, unlike service dogs, are not trained for a specific purpose or for specific tasks. tasks. Um, a wide variety of animals can be considered uh, as emotional support animals from cats to ponies to ferrets, even snakes. The um, many landlords are not don't know about the discrimination laws that apply to uh, emotional support animals. The Fair Housing Act, which is enforced by HUD, prohibits discrimination against individuals who have disabilities, uh, which may include failure to provide reasonable accommodations. Um, there's in addition to federal law, there's also city, county, and state laws, such as the New York Human Rights Law which protects tenants with emotional support animals. Um, and it's important to know the difference between emotional support animals, service animals, and therapy animals. Um, originally, dogs were the only service animals. And that was expanded uh, to include other animals. Uh, service animals, such as guide dogs, hearing dogs, and psychiatric 
animals are trained to help people with disabilities by executing specific tasks uh, like pulling a wheelchair, guiding persons that are visually impaired, providing support during seizures and common individuals suffering from PTSD. Therapy animals are not trained for specific individuals, but for patients in hospitals, nursing homes, and retirement homes. They also assist crime victims in court. So with emotional support animals, um, there's no sort of, there's no type of training. Um, and um, you, you're limited to how many questions you can ask a tenant regarding the emotional support animal. Uh, basically, you can ask, does he or she seek reasonable accommodation? Uh, does a tenant have a disability, physical or mental impairment, seriously limiting one or more major life activities? And does the disability relate to the need for an emotional support animal? You can ask for a letter of verification from their therapist or from a medical provider, uh, doctors, psychiatrists, social workers, therapists, and other mental health professionals. Uh, the letter must state that the tenant has been under the provider's care, that he or she meets the, de the definition of disability, and that due to disability, he or she needs a certain animal in order to alleviate disability-related difficulties to live independently and to enjoy that housing. So they have to have, uh, and now with um, televisits and so forth, people can get these, um, obtain these verifications from really anywhere in the country. You cannot ask for a tenant's medical records or confidential healthcare information. Um, I do strongly request, strongly suggest that you have them sign an emotional support animal lease rider. You can still have them sign a lease rider. Uh, it should identify the particular animal, uh, require proof of um, inoculations and that the dog is licensed. Um, and prohibit the animal from damaging the property, persistently barking or otherwise causing a nuisance. Uh, and these are grounds for eviction, as, as well as if they neglect the animal. The emotional support animal lease rider will state that. Uh, even though they're, they have a right to have that emotional support animal, the animal can't be a nuisance to other tenants uh, or a danger to other tenants or cause damage. Uh, you cannot restrict the specific breed or size of an emotional support animal. Uh, we have many tenants that are concerned about uh, pit bulls uh, terrorizing other tenants or other tenants being afraid of pit bulls or their liability for that, but um, you are not allowed to restrict the specific breed or size of an emotional support animal. And you cannot charge an additional security deposit or rent for emotional support animals. Uh, like you would for a pet deposit, you could normally for a pet charge a security deposit uh, or additional rent for a pet, but uh, keeping in mind that an emotional support animal um, is not considered to be a pet. We uh, create many limited liability companies for um, for landlords, and um, there's certain steps that you should take to make sure that you are um, taking advantage of all the um, benefits of a limited liability company, which is a uh, number of benefits to that, which we'll talk about. Uh, one thing is you, upon creating a limited liability company, um, you need to transfer by deed your property into the name of the limited liability company. Um, or if you're purchasing property with a limited liability company, um, have the contract um, in the name of the limited liability company so that the seller deeds the property to you. Um, if you make sure that you're, ins you're insuring your properties in the name of the li li limited liability company with a comprehensive uh, property insurance policy. Uh, we see many people don't file their state biennial registration uh, with New York State. You can do that online. 
which is basically a, to stay in good standing, um, you uh, must pay a $9 biennial registration fee every other year to the Department of State. Um, if, they have their, if they have your email, they will remind you to file your biannual statement. Also, if you're going to be transferring existing property into a limited liability company, you should check with your mortgage lender uh, to make sure they're not going to call your mortgage due um, because you are transferring your property to the LLC. Um, if you are a Delaware corporation, or excuse me, De Delaware LLC, and you have real estate in New York State, um, in order to own real estate in New York State, um, or to sue your tenants in New York State, you need to have authority to do business in New York State. So you would have to have your Delaware LLC um, authorized to do business in New York State by filing an application for authority to do business in New York State. If, um, you should assign all your current leases to the limited liability company um, or draft new leases in the name of the LLC. Um, you want to have all of your dealings with the tenant to be in the name of the LLC uh, for your liability protection so that you, uh, you're not personally responsible uh, for any injuries uh, or deaths on your property. So you would obtain a federal employer identification number for your LLC. You'd have to get a new number once you form an LLC and um, have your bank accounts in the name of the LLC uh, so that uh, your tenant's rent that's payable to the LLC can be deposited in the LLC bank account. Once the LLC is formed, you should have an LLC operating agreement um, drafted. The, um, when you open the bank account, the bank may want to see the operating agreement. Um, they don't want to see your tax identification number and the filing receipt that you have from New York State that the limited liability company um, articles of organization has been filed. Uh, there's also a requirement, um, unlike corporations, there's also a requirement that a legal notice is published in two newspapers for six weeks. Uh, that has to be um, published within four months of when you file your articles of organization. Your LLC will go into existence um, as soon as articles of organization are filed with New York State. Um, and uh, however, you have four months to publish the legal notice in one weekly and one daily newspaper uh, within four months. Uh, you should dis discuss with your uh, tax and legal and, and your tax and legal advisors about making uh, limited liability companies part of your state tax uh, and succession plan, uh, the advantages of an LLC, unlike holding real estate in your own individual name um, is you know, there are a number of advantages. Uh, the LLC has a perpetual existence. So even if you pass away, um, just like having a business in a limited liability company or in a corporation, when you pass away, uh, the, the um, entity is still in existence and it would be a, a matter of transferring um, what they call membership units with an LLC. Uh, so um, you can, um, Take advantage of gift tax um, exemptions and so forth by transferring interest in your LLC during your lifetime um, for tax advantages, um, gifting interest to family members of your limited liability company, and it will um, provide also for continuity um, of your um, real estate ownership um, beyond your beyond your existence. So. Discuss this all with your, your legal and tax advisors as to the, um, the advantages of limited liability company. Uh, many people are also using limited liability companies quite commonly, um, what we call cottage LLCs, where um, family members want to keep um, cottages, um, vacation properties in the family for multiple generations. Um, and not be concerned about family members being divorced or being sued. 
uh, and also laying out the rules of um, how who's sharing in expenses with the uh, expenses for the cottage and use of the cottage and so forth. So we've drafted some very detailed um, LLC cottage operating agreements for families um, to keep their uh, vacation properties for, uh, for multiple generations. And now I will turn this over to Justin. Sorry, took a second to get my video up there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna start out talking about ERAP still. Uh, when we first started doing these presentations, we spent uh, a lot of time talking about ERAP uh, and how that affected trying to evict someone during the pandemic. Uh, we are still talking about ERAP and uh, I'll let you know why. Uh, just in case you weren't trying to evict anyone during the pandemic, well, uh, lucky you, and you might be wondering what this is, or that stands for Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, so that was in effect uh, in New York State. Those were state funds uh, that were dedicated for paying rental arrears of uh, tenants who were behind on rent. So during the pandemic, that meant you were trying to evict someone for non-payment of rent, and someone put an application in for these ERAP payments, uh, the uh, uh, proceeding would be stayed until a determination was made on the ERAP application. Now, uh, all of those funds have uh, been exhausted for some time, but because of how long it took to process some of those applications, uh, some landlords are now are just getting paid uh, those, those monies for those rental arrears. And the uh, ramifications of uh, uh, accepting those payments uh, can last for a year. So uh, if you did accept ERAP payment and, uh, you know, it's been less than a year, uh, you cannot raise the rent. You cannot, uh, you also cannot evict someone for holdover for, you know, someone who uh, doesn't have a lease. And if they, you know, stay beyond a month and you've accepted ERAP payment within the last year, you cannot uh, uh, evict that person on the basis of holdover uh, for uh, uh, until a year passes since you uh, accepted those payments. Now, uh, there are some expect exceptions. Uh, if your unit has less, uh, if your building has less than four units and you can prove that a family member intends to occupy the unit, uh, you could evict someone on a holdover basis. Uh, additionally, if uh, that holdover tenant is causing a nuisance of some sort or uh, a violation of a lease term, you, know, you could evict on that basis. And of course, you can still evict, even if you've accepted ERAP, you can accept, uh, uh, begin an eviction uh, based on non-payment of rent. Of course, any months covered by the ERAP payment, you, you cannot evict if the state has paid for those months. But for any months beyond that, uh, then you can begin a, a non-payment proceeding. Uh, the other uh, implication of ERAP that is still currently affecting some landlords is there are still some ERAP stays uh, uh, out there. Uh, there still uh, are some ERAP applications that are under review. Uh, so the funds have been earmarked, but the determination has not been made as to whether or not the landlord is going to receive those payments. Uh, in a number of cases, uh, the amount of arrears exceeds the amount that the ERAP would cover. Now, the maximum amount that ERAP would ever cover is 15 months. So only a year and three months of rental arrears is uh, the maximum uh, possible amount that ERAP would ever cover. Some landlords are in a position where uh, the tenant owes more than 15 months rent. Uh, that means that the uh, ERAP case, uh, the ERAP application would be futile. Uh, state's never going to cover it all. And there is some recent case law in New York out of uh, New York City court uh, that said where an ERAP stay would be futile uh, for the reason that I they just described, uh, the ERAP stay uh, could be vacated and the landlord could uh, proceed with eviction. So uh, moving on from uh, that, it's just sort of the lingering specter of COVID and ERAP that we, we still have to address. Uh, we can just talk about evictions uh, more generally. And uh, the next slide, uh, the, the title is Case Studies of Complicated Evictions. You want to progress to the next slide. And uh, essentially, in this day and age, uh, every eviction is a complicated eviction. So we have some examples there. 
but uh, any eviction that you're uh, going to be initiating uh, in 2024 is going to be complicated because of uh, some of those provisions of the Tenant uh, Protection Act that Bob was talking about, and because of uh, some of the effects of the pandemic uh, on the way the courts work uh, in Erie County in particular, uh, which we'll be talking about in a, a little bit. Um, so uh, in a number of cases that we find, uh, the landlord doesn't necessarily know the name of everybody who's staying there. You know, there's uh, one person's name on the lease or two people's name on the lease. And uh, I say, you know, are there any adults living there? And oftentimes I'm told, uh, but yeah, but that doesn't matter because they're not on the lease. But uh, I'm telling you right now, it does matter because when it comes time to execute a warrant, provided it gets to that point, uh, the uh, marshal or the sheriff or, uh, you know, the law enforcement taking care of that is only going to be authorized to remove uh, the number of people that are named uh, in the warrant. And the only people that can be named in the warrants are the people who are named in the uh, initial uh, 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 paperwork. So the 14 day notice, notice termination petition, that number has got to match up with the number of people on the warrant. So uh, in Erie County and in Monroe County, what we do is say, if you don't know the person's name, we will just uh, uh, put a John or a Jane Doe on there uh, just so the, uh, the number of people on the warrant match up with the number of people in the petition. Now, sometimes this can be uh, more expensive to serve additional amount of people, but uh, you know, in the end, that it's worth it because you don't you don't want uh, uh, other individuals uh, still on the property that the marshal or sheriff is unable to remove uh, because they weren't named in the warrant or, or the initial paperwork. Now, in certain other counties, uh, uh, Orleans County in particular, uh, we've run into uh, an issue where the sheriff. Uh, in that particular county is under marching orders not to evict any John or Jane Doe's. They can only evict uh, if you have the individual's name uh, as it appears on their license. Uh, that's the only way they'll remove someone from a property. So in that situation, you know, uh, what we've done is, you know, and a lot of times these John and Jane Doe's who are on the property are there illegally. So we will suggest to the landlord to you know, file a police report for trespassing. And then that way, when law enforcement shows up, you know, they can potentially get the names uh, the, to then put on the uh, the eviction paperwork. R rarely will law enforcement do anything about removing someone who's not authorized to be there. They'll say it's a civil matter, but at least uh, uh, we that's one strategy to get the name of someone, uh, uh, an unknown name uh, of someone who might be residing in your property if you want to remove that individual. Uh, particularly in Orleans County, yeah, in Erie County and in Monroe County, where we do a lot of work, we haven't had any issues with the sheriffs or marshals removing John or Jane Doe's. Uh, something else that we're running into more frequently uh, are uh, tenants who aren't in the premises because uh, they're either in jail uh, or in, in rehab often, uh, uh, you know, in an inpatient program and they're not on the property. So, you know, uh, you know, one way to look at this is we serve them with the eviction paperwork, say you got to be in jail. I mean, you have to be in court uh, in this the, on this particular date, and then they don't show up in court. You get a warrant on default. Uh, great, you're thinking. But, um, you know, in those situations, uh, it, once the tenant gets out of a jail or rehab and finds out that, uh, you know, there's a default warrant that's either been served or executed, they would have very good grounds to file an uh, order to show cause uh, with the court to issue the warrant, asking for that warrant to be vacated uh, because they had a very uh, reasonable reason for missing the court appearance. So uh, if you have a tenant that you know is in jail or in rehab or uh, otherwise not on the premises, uh, you should find out where uh, that tenant is and have them served uh, at that location. You know, we've had cases where, uh, you know, we've served tenants who are in jail and, uh, you know, they're they're brought in in custody uh, to answer the uh, eviction petition. It's it's worth the extra step. Uh, you know, otherwise, you're just going to be losing a whole lot more time having to deal with an order to show cause and, you know, having a warrant vacated and having to start the process all over again. Uh, something else that we're running into with more and more frequency these days are uh, family members. You know who are living at home you know either with their parents or brothers or sisters um and uh you know the property owner just doesn't want them there anymore uh in these situations uh it's our position 
the family member is uh, considered a licensee, not entitled to the same amount of notice that uh, a tenant would be entitled to. So uh, in those situations, we serve them with a 10-day uh, notice to vacate. If they're not out at the end of 10 days, we start eviction proceedings. Uh, where a caution be considered a licensee, there can't be any sort of landlord-tenant relationship. So if you have a family member who's staying with you that's paying rent, even if there's no formal agreement, uh, I would caution against uh, this strategy because as long as there's some sort of a contractual relationship where money's changing hands, a court would not consider them a licensee. Uh, a defense that we often see to these sort of evictions uh, is uh, the family member exception to the licensee provision of the real property law, uh, which at one point was broad, uh, and uh, really anyone who's related to the individual who owns the property could say, you know, I, I, I'm exempt from this licensee provision uh, because I'm a family member. Uh, now, that exception has been eroded away in recent years by case law to the point where the only way a family member could invoke that defense is if there's some sort of support obligation between the owner and the person's living there such as, you know, a, a, a married couple, a uh, husband just can't, you know, uh, evict his wife uh, based on a 10 day notice or an adult child uh, who is somehow uh, dependent upon a parent uh, for support who's never lived on his or her own. In that case, a support obligation, you know, could be uh, interpreted in which case you would need to uh, uh, start with a formal ejectment action, which requires a full six months notice before bringing the ejectment in uh, in the Supreme Court is obviously much lengthier and uh, and complicated process. But where there's no support obligation, where there's no money changing hands, uh, we provide a 10 day notice and uh, uh, start eviction after uh, 10 days have passed. And this isn't just for family members. Uh, we do this in cases of you know you know boyfriends and girlfriends living together where the relationship has gone sour or just. You know, oftentimes someone will bring a friend in and say, you know, you know, stay here until you get on their feet. And, um, you know, that gets old quick and, you know, they want to get rid of someone who refuses to leave willingly. As long as there's no support obligation or money hasn't changed hands, a uh, 10-day notice would, would usually suffice. Uh, just in general, speaking about complicated evictions, again, in, in Erie County, I mean, you're looking at, uh, if you can't stipulate uh, to an outdate, you're looking at at least three appearances in most cases. Um, as I'll discuss in a little while, uh, all evictions in Erie County now go through Buffalo City Court. And the way that they do it is there's a first appearance. Uh, and if a tenant shows up, they're not even uh, provided the opportunity to request an adjournment. The court just gives a new date for the tenant to obtain counsel, uh, come back in the second date. And nothing is decided on that second date either. That's to put any sort of stipulation on the record. Uh, so if there is no stipulation of the second appearance, at that point, a third appearance is scheduled. Uh, and that goes uh, in front of uh, Judge Carney uh, in the case of uh, all Erie County evictions other than city evictions, or we'll go in front of a city court judge if it's a property in the city. Now, uh, oftentimes what I do is at the very first appearance, uh, when there's an automatic adjournment given, you know, I, I indicate that there's uh, you know, not likely to be a stipulation reached uh, by the next court appearance. And I ask for uh, an, a hearing date uh, directly in front of the judge at the first appearance. That way we can skip the second appearance and go straight to a hearing. And if we reach a stipulation prior to that, great. You know, we put it on the record uh, with the city court judge. Uh, but uh, I oftentimes find these second appearances are uh, completely unnecessary and adds uh, at least an additional two weeks uh, to the process. Uh, if you could just go back a slide. So uh, for non-payment evictions in Erie County and in Suffolk County and in some courts in Monroe County, if you're doing a non-payment petition, uh, there is a form now that you need to include instead of a notice of petition that you would, you know, draft uh, based on some uh, boilerplate yourself. There is a form available on the court's website and right here. It'll be available to you uh, when you get the materials. So if you're starting an eviction in Erie County and it's a non-payment eviction, 
you need to attach this to the front of the petition that has the basic information, provides information to the uh, tenant about, you know, uh, free legal services. If you don't include this uh, in Erie County, when you're filing a non-payment eviction, and again, this is just for non-payment evictions, uh, not for holdovers, uh, you need to include this form or the petition uh, will be rejected. Okay, and uh, uh, this is also in Suffolk County. I don't know if we have anyone from downstate uh, uh, viewing today, but this will also be the form that you use in Suffolk County. And in Monroe County, uh, if you are starting an eviction in Rochester City Court or in the Justice Courts of Gates, Greece, or Arondequoit, you would use this form, not for any other Justice Court in uh, Monroe County, but again, Rochester City Court, Gates, Greece and Aranaquite have all adopted uh, this form. Uh, if you go on the uh, Monroe uh, County Courts website, uh, you can find this there. It is slightly altered where you can check off which court, uh, you know, on the top left-hand corner, it will say Rochester, Gates, Greece, or Aranaquite Courts, you could check off, but other, otherwise the form is identical. And I've used this form in Monroe County and haven't had a problem. Hey, but just uh, shifting from Monroe County back to uh, Erie County, uh, I've, I've hinted at this earlier. Uh, if you've tried to uh, evict someone in Erie County, you're aware of this. A lot of folks aren't aware of this. Uh, ever since uh, sort of mid-pandemic, uh, because of the new rules that were put in place during the pandemic, all evictions in Erie County were centralized in what's called the Erie County Hub Court, which is located in the Buffalo City Court. Uh, that means that all evictions in Erie County now go through Buffalo City Court, uh, just so that there's some consistency in, in the way things go. Uh, and whereas uh, corporations, LLCs could appear uh, on their own in the justice courts, now they must appear uh, through attorneys uh, in the uh, Erie County Hub Court. So the process of uh, filing in Erie County Hub Court is, is not intuitive uh, because it doesn't start in the Hub Court. Uh, you're going to have to go uh, to the uh, village or town court first. Uh, essentially, what you do is you get a, a court date from the local court. So you call up uh, your local court, wherever your property is located, and ask, uh, you know, what I say is I ask for a, a fake date for an eviction because it's never going to be heard in that court. But uh, the, the you know the, the heading on your your petition is going to have the name of that local court, and it's going to instruct the tenant to show up in that court. Uh, you get the date from that court, serve it ten to seventeen days before the date you put on the petition, and then once you have your affidavit of service, you go file the petition, the affidavit of service, and the twenty dollar filing fee uh, at the local court. You got to go do that in in person. Uh, once the local court has uh, all of that paperwork and the filing fee, they will scan and fax everything over to the hub court uh, in the Buffalo City Court. And then both you and the tenant will be advised of the new court date uh, in the hub court uh, that uh, has uh, instructions about how to appear in hub court. And because it's not convenient for everybody all across Erie County to get to, uh, those appearances are conducted uh, via Zoom, or uh, it, you can call that in as well. Uh, oftentimes, you don't get notice of uh, the rescheduled date until the uh, fake date in the local court has passed. So it's been a source of great confusion amongst uh, tenants and landlords. Um, but eventually, Buffalo City Court, the hub court, will send a notice to both the tenant and the landlord about the new date and with instructions about how to appear uh, virtually uh, or by phone. Okay, and then once the case is transferred, everything gets filed. You know, those orders to show cause, uh, the, the tenants will often file uh, amended petitions. All that gets filed then through the Erie County hub court. Um, that can be done online or could be uh, filed in person. Okay, I, I know that that's, uh, again, not intuitive and I have a tendency to, to speak quickly. So if we need to go over uh, uh, any of that again um, in the question and answer period, I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss that again. Great, thank you so much for all that information. Are you ready for Q&A yet, Justin? Sure. Okay, As great. Bob, Bob is as well, I, I saw some questions in there that he may be better uh, suited to field. 
Okay. But, uh, yeah, yeah, you can, you can yeah. hit us with the questions now. There are lots of questions. Um, so I'll start uh, on the order. Some of these you may have already covered, but they were asked earlier on, but I think they're, they may be worth repeating uh, just for clarity. Raven asking, uh, can you shed light on pet fees and what is actually legal? Um, sure, I'm glad to see all these questions people are paying attention. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, there's no restrictions on charging uh, additional security deposit for people with pets. Uh, there again, we're not talking about emotional service animals or service dogs. You can't charge additional security deposits for those. But um, we still uh, recommend that you have a um, riders on your lease um, identifying the pets and um, requiring them to be inoculated. Um, and um, covering that uh, the security deposits will be deducted for any damages um, caused by the pets. And yeah. uh, if they do violate, you know, you want to have those provisions in there. So if the pet is causing a, a nuisance, uh, that's our, the, uh, such as the ones that are enumerated in your, in your lease or your rider, that they will give you grounds to evict the tenant. If the pet's causing a nudist, uh, causing a nuisance or uh, causing damage to the property. Yeah, and John was asking a similar question about adding additional security deposit for pets. Is that allowed? Yes, yes. If it's okay. long, long, not for uh, emotional support animals or for service dogs. Yes. Additional All right. And uh, uh, additional rent also. Okay. And Miriam was asking as well, what if your insurance won't cover you if there's a certain dog breed? Well, yes, that's there. There are insurance policies that exclude um, certain dog breeds. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, this, I don't think this has been challenged, but I think it's, uh, in that case, I think it's unreasonable to require landlords um, to accept dangerous dog breeds that are offered by the insurance uh, it, it could possibly be a defense to a um, discrimination lawsuit that it's not really a reasonable, not really a reasonable accommodation, but, um, but the regulations say that um, any sort of dog breed, um, it, there cannot be restrictions on dog breeds. Mm. Okay. Um, also, some questions came in about um, evictions. Uh, Eric says, you mentioned 10 day notices. Can you explain when you would give an occupant a 30 day notice as a quote tenant at will, as opposed to a 10 day notice as a quote licensee? Yeah. So that, that would be a situation in which, you know, there, there's, there's no lease um, but there is a relationship that could be construed as a landlord tenant relationship because there's, there's money changing hands. Mm. So, uh, a 10 day notice is, uh, again, situation with a family member, friend, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend that's just residing on the premises, but there's nothing that could be construed as a landlord tenant relationship because the no money has, uh, exchanged hands. Uh, tenant at will is, uh, there is a tenancy relationship because some money has been paid, but there's no lease in place. Mm, okay. That makes sense. Uh, Brendan asking on a petition for holdover, as opposed to John slash Jane Doe, can you instead write, quote, any and all others? Well, you know, I'm really overly cautious and, uh, you know, in any situation where it comes to a uh, marshal or sheriff law enforcement executing a warrant, they're going to strongly suggest that everybody on the premises get the heck out of there. And most people are probably going to listen. But uh, if you put any and all others that used to, that used to fly, but now uh, we, we want to make sure that everybody who's there is is personally or substitute served. Uh, with the paperwork. So again, erring on the side of caution, we try to figure out how many people are there and uh, and serve John Jane those rather than uh, indeterminate number of people, any and all others. Mm. So better to be safe there on that. Um, Craig asked uh, in the chat and Q&A, can you please discuss evictions and other important landlord tenant issues for Westchester County, especially in the city of Yonkers. So any any highlights there that you can share for that area? 
We don't. Yeah, unfortunately, New York's a big state. Yes. <laughs> and we don't. We don't. We don't practice in that part of the state. We don't practice land or tenant law in that mm. part of the state. So we're not qualified to. Well, Craig, I. I may have somebody, yeah, I may have somebody I can refer Craig to. So okay. Craig, I'll keep your question here uh, and reach out to you after. Um, also, uh, in co-op developments, Tracy's asking, um, what documentation may the management company require of a tenant making an accommodation request, such as a ramp installation? Okay, so I, I think someone's talking about uh, someone having a physical disability. Yes. And if, 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 a, if a disability is obvious, you don't need, um, you, don't, you cannot require documentation. So if someone's obviously um, needs a wheelchair uh, or uh, some other assistive device, you're not permitted to ask for medical verification if, it, if it's obvious. It's only if it was not maybe some sort of uh, which wouldn't apply to this situation, but maybe certain site, certain uh, new one accommodation for a psychiatric uh, type of med or something. But uh, this is for someone with a physical disability. Um, they can't ask for verification. Yeah, and I, I have a question for that answer as well. So, what would the what would be the point at which it would just be a financial burden to the landlord? where they wouldn't need to perhaps uh, do that ramp installation. How does that happen? Well, yeah, that, that would be, yeah, well, no, that, that's a good question. Yeah, that's, it has to be reasonable. It would have to be something, uh, I don't think there's any sort of dollar limit, but, you know, to, to majorly change the, the structural, um, structure okay. of the property um, might be something that's unreasonable. Uh, the, uh, like I said, I don't think there's any dollar amount, but anything major construction would probably be unreasonable. The argument, if you could verify that, it's unreasonable because of the enormous cost. Mm. I mean, putting a ramp in, uh, you know, normally should not be much of a cost unless they have it. Uh, Not because, yet. You know, um, changes to the property. Um, so Kelly asked uh, in the chat, can you please talk a bit about an applicant that owes a balance to a previous landlord? Are you not allowed to consider that when reviewing an application? Well, there's, um, there are, that can be considered uh, if it's not state funded, pretty much that cannot be consideration uh, if someone uh, has some sort of governmental it cannot be if it's a governmental assistance. Uh, it could possibly be, uh, yeah, it could be if it's um, not government subsidized property or a voucher or whatever. Uh, however, you cannot, there is prohibitions now. That's one of the major changes and which I didn't cover of the New York uh, Tenant Protection Act um, that you can't, well, the law says that you can't, refuse to rent to a potential tenant on the basis that the potential tenant was involved in a past or pending landlord tenant action or summary proceeding. And I think they're talking about an actual eviction, uh, unlike a landlord that has recovered a judgment against someone. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's more of a, a record of having an eviction as opposed to having a money judgment against them. So that's, they could possibly do that if it was consider judgments um, in their credit history. Interesting. If, if it was reduced to a judgment. Right, right. Hmm. Okay. Um, Raven uh, was asking, because we had talked about extra security deposit for pets at some point. And she's saying, how can you charge extra security if you cannot accept any more than one month? One month, right. Well, I, you could possibly charge, um, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, you could, like I said, you could char you could charge additional rent for the pet and then a security deposit to uh, cover that additional rent in that, in, in that instance. Yeah, and Tracy was asking a similar question, which is what is the cap or the max on security deposit for pets specifically? Um, there is none. All right, um, going back a little bit to the pets seems to be such a popular topic as always. Um, Joseph asking, can you request tenants to buy liability insurance if they want to have a pet because they claim they have an emotional support animal? Um, no, you cannot. Okay, and is there a weight limit for an emotional support dog? 
if they're living in a small apartment? No, there cannot be weight limits. Interesting. These answers are not making our landlords happy, Bob. <laughs> well, they, I never, I, I, I've been saying that for years. I, I, I uh, years. Don't listen to me. Goodness. No, it you know, it's, every, it's, it gets worse every year. Yeah, I know you're right. We put out a, an article today. I'm about to send it to you, Bob, so you can share it with your audience as well of your nine common mistakes, right? That people make with emotional support animals. Like we that. went over that. Yeah. So we've been getting some great feedback on it. Um, people seem to not know these things about them. So um, I know it seems a little unfair for the landlord, but that is how it is, unfortunately. Um, all well, right. There's really no bad faith, I don't think. We're finding out landlords that get super discrimination just have no idea. Right, right. The protections are. They're not. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so let's go through these. We have five more open questions here. Eric, for a post foreclosure property bought at auction, if you don't know whether the occupant is a tenant or a prior owner, don't use a combined 10 day, 90 day notice. And if so, can you explain how that works? He, he um, corrected it a few he down. He corrected it, right? Oh, yeah. yes, yeah. I see that. So there's a. Do um, you use a combined 10 day or 90 day notice? That makes so more sense. A 10 day notice. For okay, well, he's talking about is there's a 10 day notice uh, that served on an uh, if you buy property of foreclosure, there's a 10 day notice that you serve on the owner. That's all you with a copy of the deed. That's how you terminate uh, the right. owner. The owner's still saying I foreclose. And then I guess he's thinking about the 90 day notice. Um, well, he's asking if you don't case. know, right? If you don't which know, is which, but if, if you're know. you probably know who the owner is though, if you're purchasing it. Right. In which case, or you serve the ten day notice. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, right. So, right, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So it would be the ninety day notice to be on the safe. If side. he's been there more than two years, if it's a tenant. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm, yeah, you're right. You should probably have that information before you buy it. I know it's an auction, so maybe that information might be limited, but um, certainly that would help to know. Uh, Raven. When it comes to vouchers, can you ask the applicant how much money their voucher is for, or can you ask to see their voucher? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, and that's the recommended um, that's the rent recommended rental application. You should have that on your rental application. You can ask what the source of income is. You know, have various lines on your rental application um, listing all your sources of income and how much the income is. So you certainly can ask that and and. Uh, the only caveat is you have to consider that the same as uh, earned income. Mm. So I recommend you, you know, change your rental applications to um, state, you know, where the source of these people's income is. Yeah, time. that's what we use as well in our rental application for our members. It says sources of income, not yeah employment income specifically or work income. It's any kind of income and there's multiple types that they can select from. So um, that's probably a good idea to start doing. Uh, Raven is asking, can you ask it before showing the apartment? Raven, if you could uh, expand on, oh, you mean, oh, if you could ask for proof of income before they go see the uh, apartment. So is that uh, the order um, that it could go well, in? I, I I think the best procedure is um, if someone's interested in the apartment, if you show it, have them complete a rental application and then notify them, you know, what your decision is. I, I think you need to get uh, to avoid any, uh, you know, verbal discussions can be misconstrued and used against landlords. So I just go through, have your procedures set up. You show the apartment, if they're interested, they submit a rental application. Um, and then you, uh, you date the rental application and you, you're you allowed to consider multiple rental applications. So I think it's the best is to get the rental application into the, into the flow of the, um, the screening process. Yeah, I agree with that. There's what's legal, right? What's what you have to do, but then there's also what's just going to be the best order of operations uh, to avoid any issues. So that, that sounds like a good plan. Um, you'll, get checker, you'll get checkers and testers calling you um, right. and trying to, trying to get you to uh, state things that you shouldn't be stating. 
All right, Craig, I see your email. Thank you. I will reach out to you after this. Uh, M. Clark, what is the state doing to get the info out about the HPTSA Act? I haven't heard of that one. Have you? That's the that's the housing. That's the uh, you're talking about. The, that's a 2019 housing protection. Oh, I mean, okay. 2019. <laughs> I hadn't housing seen it abbreviated. It's been out for four and a half years. Yeah. So I guess at this point, I mean, I don't know what the state is doing to get it out, but we've certainly covered it quite a bit. So we're trying to still tell our members about it. Um, and the same thing with the California one too. There was uh, one in California that four years now, five years. Uh, so it's it, it just takes a while for people to start to get up to date on the laws. That's why we have these kind of presentations and whatnot. Um, Dennis, uh, in New York City, a rent stabilized tenant issue. Uh, the son is the tenant of record and signed lease renewal every year, but he doesn't live there. Only his senior mother, who is difficult to deal with. The son doesn't assume responsibility to his mother. Can we hold him responsible anyway? Um, I'm here again. We don't deal with any rent stabilized departments. Mm -hmm. So I can't, I'm not qualified to answer that question. No worries. Yeah, those are tricky, definitely different. Um, so I'll see if I can connect you as well with someone who can maybe help you with that specific question. Uh, Eric Haber, do you think good cause eviction will come to Long Island? I hope not. I want to be able to evict tenants whose leases have expired. Have you there, seen anything uh, like that? Yeah, there haven't been any updates in the past year on good cause uh, evictions. Um, they've, um, they really haven't moved forward at all. The, the bill in New York State um, uh, hasn't been passed. Um, they've been declared to be um, unconstitutional. So there's really no, we don't really have any updates on good cause mm. evictions. Okay, fingers crossed. Um, right. M. Clark asking uh, a pretty general question. What exemptions are co-ops allowed? I don't, I think I know if that question has to do with um, emotional support animals. Or Maybe, not. I'm not sure. Uh, if you wanna put in some more details on that, cause it's a pretty general question. Um, I'm sure there are exemptions for different categories. So um, James asking, can you deny an application based on credit scores even if the proposed tenant has a voucher or other income that would normally qualify the tenant. So they have the income, but they don't have a good credit score and that income is a voucher. If it's, if it's covered, no, you can't. It's already been determined uh, you know, that uh, you cannot consider credit scores at all if the voucher covers entire rent. Yeah. It's yeah. already been determined to qualify um, with their income to get the voucher. That's, that's prohibited. Good answer there. That's something I think people need to definitely know. Um, Kelly. Partial, I could, anyone wants to fill out one of our contact forms, I can send them. There's, a, yeah. there's a, about a 12 page long guidelines on considering credit if, if it's par partially voucher oh. and partially self I, I would love to have that, Bob. If you could send that to me, I'll share it with everyone here on the right. webinar and maybe even you know outside of it because. That's, I mean, we, all of our members, they use us for tenant screening. So we have to be really careful with, you know, getting that information out there. So they aren't using it if they're not supposed to. Um, let's yeah, see. The New York State, New York State uh, Homes and Community Renewal has a complete guide on that with all, and a certification that landlords must keep for two years. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll share that with you tomorrow so you can get the full guidelines on that and how to use those um, reports. Just uh, finishing up here with uh, Kelly, a comment really that I think we could end with. I'm from Houston and have been managing properties over there forever. I just got here a year ago and wow, it's very different. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> this is why we're doing this webinar today because it is quite different. There are so many even within New York as you know, you just mentioned within certain areas, things can be very different, uh, even county to county. And so um, I'm so happy that we are at least able to share some general information with you all today. Um, I think, you know, I certainly 
always learn something new whenever you both come on and talk to the group. So we'll be sure to share this with everyone. And uh, we did put Rent Magazine out today. So um, we'll send a link to that as well in the follow-up email. So look out for your emails tomorrow. You're going to get the full recording, the slides, and all the resources that we discussed today. And hopefully we'll have another update for you in the future uh, with our wonderful speakers here. Uh, M. Clark says, thanks. Always great info. You're welcome. Uh, glad that we could all join today. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. And thank you again. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.